This episode was recorded in front of a live audience where viewers voted for the ingredients. It has been edited down from its original runtime. It's a dreary day. We're going to do a country fruit wine today. So country fruit wine is how I got started homebrewing. I was a very much a doing the moster when I started <laughs> making homebrew. I have been making country fruit wines for a long time, so about 10 years. So let's go ahead and get started with voting. All the ingredients that we have today to vote on came from Jack Keller country fruit wine recipes. Now that's not to say that all these ingredients will work well together. That's part of the fun of this show. We've got boxes for fruit, tannin, for acid, and then we have our wild card box. You'll be voting on all of those. The yeast we're going to use today is going to be EC1118, the recommended yeast for country fruit wines. And then our fermentable sugar, per Jack's standards, will be this bag of cane sugar. All of his one gallon recipes seem to have three pounds of sugar in them. We're going to brew it up in the Mr. Beer, <laughs> which I sanitized this morning. Your first option for fruit, grapes. Each fruit option should be about three pounds of fruit. These are tart. They are seedless. They've got some stems. We could maybe leave the stems on a few of them. Second option, blueberries. Frozen and thawing, question mark. They're Driscoll's, only the finest berries. Third option. We have Bella Gardens Sunburst Mixed Fruit. So we could do a mixed fruit wine. I like to call that a garbage wine, usually. Strawberries, peaches, pineapple, red seedless grapes, and then they have added citric acid and ascorbic acid to promote color retention. I've got one more option down here for y'all to vote on. Honeydew melons. Think I can juggle these? I don't even know if I can get these into the air to juggle them. So those are your options for fruit. While you're discussing, we need to rack off our mead that we made. Ugh, <laughs> that is a strong one. Oh, I forgot there were smoked jalapenos in here too. Well, now I'm really curious to taste it. Currently, honeydew is way in the lead. So let's pull a taste on this. I'm gonna guess that this is gonna be boozy and dry. It's got a pretty big fruit nose to it if you can like sniff past the alcohol. Whew. What did we put in this? <laughs> Mixed berries, lemon peel, and juice. Okay, there is definitely a, a acid pop in there that's not just from the berries. It tastes like acid and it tastes like hot. Definitely leached a lot of capsaicin out of the uh, jalapenos. So there's like a burn that takes over the flavor. It's kind of vegetal, not like super vegetal, but you can definitely tell there's like vegetable matter in there. And just having absolutely no sweetness remaining, there is nothing balancing that out. The body on it's nice. Back sweetening this would be nice. I think we'll let this just chill for a couple of weeks and then we will uh, we'll probably stabilize and back sweeten. And that'll give it some time for stuff to drop out of it too. And it looks like we're gonna go with honeydew melon. So we gotta vote for box two now. This is tannin. Jack's recipes have a pretty common tannin theme throughout. And I was talking to Ann about this this morning. What's so interesting about Jack's recipes is there is there's definitely a lot of common threads throughout his recipe construction, but he seems to choose tannin, acid, and yeast for specific purposes. And he doesn't really talk about that or why he does it, but it's clear if you look at a lot of Jack's recipes, it's clear that he's using things in a very specific way for a specific desired result. And one of the really interesting things, there's a yeast, I think it's RC212, that he calls for in one of his recipes. And that was way before yeast selection was as in vogue as it is now. And so he was definitely like borrowing from master vintners in pairing yeast with whatever specific fruit or vegetable he was fermenting, which I think is really, really cool. Things that Jack would use for tannin. Very frequently, he would use just powdered wine tannin. 
And I'm gonna guess that a melon ferment is really gonna need some tannin to help carry its very delicate, very subtle flavor forward. Another thing that Jack will use from time to time is tea. Here we have black tea. If we were to use this, we would steep it for 10 minutes or so, really extract some of the tannins out of this tea bag, and then pour that in. We wouldn't throw this into primary. Jack was definitely into nutrients and making sure that your wines have the proper nutrition. But for tannin and body, a lot of his old recipes have raisins. So we have here a box of golden raisins. Sometimes he will call for specifically for sultanas. Sometimes it's black raisins. Sometimes it's whole raisins and sometimes it's chopped or minced raisins. So we'll have to figure out exactly how we want to treat the raisins if you go that direction. In a weird way, I think that this might actually complement the, the melons really well. Lastly on our list, every now and then, homeboy would throw in a banana. So what banana does is banana adds body and then the peel can add tannic value. My preference would be to do banana peel on. Y'all can discuss and debate the merits of all these. I'm in favor of either of these. I think these are kind of cutting ourselves short if we go with tea or tannin, but it's your show. I'm just here to mix stuff up. So while y'all are voting and discussing, let's go ahead and figure out what we're gonna do with these melons. I had almost up until this point forgotten what honeydew melon smells like. They kind of stink. Tyler says spoon out the seeds and then spoon the guts from the skin much quicker than cutting the skin off. Cool. So we are scooping out our seeds. Is there any reason why we're not fermenting the seeds? Probably because they don't add anything. They might add some tannin. I'm not going to get like really obsessed with getting them all out of there. I'll hashtag do my best. Wanted to vote for banana, but as an Englishman, I couldn't let the side down and not vote for tea. <laughs> nice. This is a lot of work. Looks like currently banana is in the lead in your voting. I guess I should weigh one of these so we can get an average weight. It's three pounds almost exactly. So then if we go with banana, which it looks like we will, do you want to do the whole banana? Maybe just cut it up into rings or peel it, throw the peel in, toss the fruit. Maybe I'll eat the fruit. What do y'all want to do with our banana for tannin or body? One pound and six ounces of this was the shell. Just under half of it. Yeah, we should get about four pounds of fruit out of all of this. Roughly, approximately. That's pretty good. It's actually very sweet. That's good. Surprisingly good for honeydew melon in winter. Man, if this retains any of this flavor, this could be a really fun wine. I don't want to add pectic enzyme to this. I'm hoping that these don't break down a lot, but just like through the power of osmosis, most everything leaches out. So that way when we rack off, we can leave most of the stuff behind. And then we might add a double dose of pectic enzyme at the end to, uh, to help clear it up. Okay, so let's talk about our next ingredients. We've got a box for acid. So I was looking at all of his recipes and tried to pull things that I thought Jack considered to be acid amendments. And his acid amendments follow a very clear, very clear protocol. And basically anything that he uses for acid amendment is in here. Sans lactic acid. Sometimes he recommends using an 80% lactic acid blend, which I thought was really interesting and weird because I have used lactic acid in brews. And when that lactic acid flavor hits, it tastes like barf. One of the main forms of acid amendment that Jack does is acid blend. Acid blend is pretty old school. It's not really recommended now because best practices now are seen as adjusting with the acid you want to build up the profile that you want. And so a lot of times you'll see me using citric or malic acid. This contains citric and malic, but it also contains tartaric acid. And this is blended to kind of be grape adjacent blend of acids. So the same kind of acid profile that you would get in a, like a white wine. It's kind of made to mimic that. 
But again, this is old school. I'm actually kind of surprised that I have this, but I have it because I so rarely use it. Second on our list is an orange. Jack, interestingly enough, will just like cut up an orange and throw it into some recipes. And sometimes there will be other acids along with it, but it seems like just an orange seems to be part of his deal. And then citric acid, straight citric acid. I actually have this for making mozzarella, but then it has moved in and become a kind of permanent fixture in here as well, even though I only really ever add it like by the gram. It's a very minute amounts. And then last, this one is exceedingly common in Jack's recipes. It's a lemon. Currently in here, you have honeydew. We're gonna cut up a banana and throw some rings of banana in here. And then we're gonna put sugar in here, but we're voting now on what we wanna do to balance our acid in this wine. I definitely think the fruit is the more fun choice. But there is also something to be said for just throwing in a gram or two of acid blend and being done with it. Acid blend, we can get it out of the inventory. <laughs> Remind me, did y'all want to try and push the fruit out of here or just throw it in because, like Jeremy said, it's probably going to dissolve anyhow? It's a very ripe banana. Inside will melt, it'll be fine, okay. And let's open up a bottle. Episode one was our orange marmalade rice syrup hooch. Episode two, is that our Tezo tea? I'll have to help me remember what we've got in the bottles. We'll start with episode one here. Hopefully these have bottle conditions. They've been in bottles for a little while now. Shout out to Super Thai for sending us these cool beaker glasses. <laughs> Lightly carbonated. <laughs> Drinking from lab equipment would get fired from a real chem job. Yeah. It smells like beer, kind of. That's weird. Because I taste chocolate on the back. It's delicate and acidic up front in a way that kind of makes you think orange. That fades quickly and it becomes just like watery in the mid palate. But then you swallow and exhale and there's just like a teaser of chocolate and toffee that hangs out at the back of your tongue. So I'm gonna guess this is the type of thing that like needs to mellow. So some of those flavors blend more and it's not such a staggered, like if you have a stair step effect in your flavors, that can be nice, but this is not that. This is a jarring difference in flavors and mouthfeel and sensations. But that like subtle chocolate note on the back is interesting. I didn't think that was gonna come through. I think it could use more body. I think it needed maybe some powdered tannin in there too. Oh yeah, yeah, it is episode zero. Sorry, not episode one. Looks like lemon is out in front. This is weird. I think if I was gonna do this again, I would do quite a bit more of the marmalade. I think the, the alcohol content on it is nice. There's no burn, it drinks real smooth. So I think we nailed that there, but it's lacking tannin and I want more orange flavor out of that. So lemon has one. What do y'all wanna do with the lemon? Do you want to use the whole thing, just the juice? Paula says zest and juice. I don't have my zester back here, so we'll have to carefully peel the zest off. Whole thing uncut up. <laughs> just, just chuck it in and hope for the best. Y'all are ridiculous. Is this what happens when we've got a relatively vanilla broadcast? So we just have to find ways to screw it up. I want to throw a shout out to these folks, our patrons and VIP members who vote on style. If you want to vote on the style every week, we put up a poll for our YouTube members and our patrons so that they can vote on style, on what we're going to make. Sorry, I'm removing spam. They voted on making a country fruit wine this time around. So that's how we got here. These folks are rock stars. They support a lot of the craziness that's happening in the studio here. So you can go to doingthemost.org and find our Patreon link there or just click join under any of our YouTube videos and become a member. This is our wild card box, as I'm sure many of you are familiar with now. Again, things that are found in Jack Keller country fruit winemaking recipes. I love wasps. I say that as somebody who has been attacked by a horde of wasps 
Okay, so first thing up on our wildcard box for you to vote for. Y'all might recognize these from a certain beer episode we did on our YouTube channel that's doing the most over on YouTube. We've got Blades of Mace. David ate one on that episode and then couldn't feel his mouth for like 10 minutes. They're like the little wrap on the outside of the nutmeg. They smell like nutmeg. Second wild card ingredient is this little thumb of ginger. Give it a little spice, a little, little pepperiness. Third ingredient in our wild card box, flaked coconut. Smells good. Tastes good too. I'm gonna open another bottle because I've got a tickle in my throat. This doesn't look like it's super well carbonated yet either. I may have to move these up into the attic to store them. It smells like Tezo tea. When we did this last, the black lime that was in here was really, really forward. So I'm curious if that remains. It does. It's kind of the only flavor in there. We'll see how that ages. I don't dislike it. I like black lime tea. So, you know, I'm a fan. It's refreshing, and I love the flavor of black limes. It's just so rich and earthy. Like those earthy notes you get in a red wine, just like get you right in the sides of the tongue. It's nice. No propane torch? No, I don't have a propane torch back here. That would be a fun one for Brews Lab. Set some stuff on fire. How much flavor do I think the coconut would give up? Probably a considerable amount. I think it's going to end up being like a subtle note of coconut. Probably an exhale note would be my guess. I, I think if we toasted it, the toasty flavor would probably cause too much of my yard flavor to come out. That's probably not gonna benefit the melon at all. It's not bitter, but it is tannic. I mean, it tastes like a black lime. Lastly, Fennel seeds. Now I think Jack used fennel, probably the fronds or the root, but fennel's got, I mean, the seeds are kind of in the same family. It's got a licorice-y flavor. Yeah, it smells like warm spices and licorice, kind of like anise. I think fennel could be really fun in this. Those are your options for wild card, mace, fennel, ginger root, or coconut flakes. While y'all are voting, I will, Get this guy sorted. Trying to get as little pith as I can. Whew, man, I love the smell of lemon zest. It's so bright, it reminds me of summer. It's funny that people have come into home brewing more and more as this situation has been going on as like a thing to do at home. But the real joy of home brewing is sharing something that you love with other people. And fortunately, I get the ability to do that by sharing my recipes on YouTube. But man, if somebody didn't realize they liked black lime and you hand them a bottle of this and they like light up, seeing that look in their face as they light up is a real thrill. And I miss that aspect. All the homebrew that I'm giving away right now, I don't get to see their reaction when they love it or hate it. Looks like coconut is out in front right now. That's fun. I'm gonna put our three pounds of sugar in here. And clearly we're not gonna be able to get a reliable gravity reading on here, but maybe somebody can plug all of this into the mead calculator. Maybe we can get an estimate on gravity. Yeah, what the heck guys? I thought fennel was gonna be the hit. Fennel in this could be a heck of a lot of fun. So we need to get our sugar in here. Three pounds of granulated cane sugar. I was told by a subscriber on YouTube that when I talk about granulated sugar, I need to specify that it's cane sugar. And I guess because beet sugar and other sugars are more common around the world, whereas here, if you're getting sugar, it's cane sugar. So I'm trying to be more cognizant of that. Rub duck, so I'm with you, man. Coconut is safe. This is a safe choice. That's taken us to one and seven eighths gallon by volume. This is syrupy, y'all. Do we have any estimates on what the uh, gravity of this might be? 
I missed the pull. What, was it coconut? Are we putting coconut in here? Okay. Three ounces of coconut. Last thing we've got to do is pitch in our yeast. Again, we're not going to, we'll have to run some calculations to know, but there's so much sugar locked up in the fruit in here. I'm not even going to bother with a gravity reading. Like a gravity reading wouldn't really mean anything to us. So why bother? It smells like lemon. <laughs> yeah, we're going to use EC1118 champagne yeast. It's a real killer. So hopefully it'll cut through all of this. And I'm pitching in the whole packet. Somebody asked on the channel yesterday about me pitching in a whole packet of yeast into a one gallon batch. And I understand it from an economics standpoint, but, um, and it may, maybe it's not best practice. It's not really over pitching. It's like over pitching for what you need to get a colony started. But I also am not a big fan of juggling a bunch of half empty yeast packets around. And so for me, somebody who at any one time has 20 to 40 packets of yeast on hand, it's not worth it to me to keep half a packet of yeast around. Your mileage may vary. It may be more economical for you to use, uh, you know, one gram per gallon to pitch, but I'm cool with just yeeting the whole thing in there. Are we gonna do nutrients in this? I don't know. Obviously this isn't like a high nitrogen must because when you think about the fruit content in here, that melon is mostly juice. I think I kind of want to let it ride. Jack would use yeast energizer a lot. I've got some of that, which is diammonium phosphate, spring cell, and magnesium phosphate. I'm open to putting some in. It says half a teaspoon per gallon. So we probably want to put two teaspoons in here. I don't know that we need it though. Let's put a teaspoon in there. I've got it, right? Might as well. This came with Homebrew Ohio's beginner mead making kit. That's where I got this from. It's not a thing that I keep on hand, but it seems like valuable enough for Brews Lab that I would keep it around in the event that we ever needed it. Here we are, I guess. It's weird. You can see the little bits of dap in there like little white specks. So let's put our lid on here. Give it a good shake. I don't know how this is gonna turn out, but I'm a little excited about it. <laughs> Not gonna lie. I, I will be honest that I was hoping the fennel seeds would make their way in here, but maybe they'll make their way into another uh, future episode. Maybe I'll just do an episode where everything's licorice flavored actual candy licorice and fennel and anise all the things so an estimate of 1.083 says larry that seems about right cosmosis says i like how you're into the more interesting funky flavors i struggle being adventurous that's the thing so i mostly do five gallon brewing which i love because there's like lots to age and lots to share so you can get a really good understanding of what your ingredients are doing in five gallon batches but for this show it would be very expensive to do five gallon batches. So that's why we're doing these little one and two gallon batches. And I feel like, particularly with the viewer voting, this is a great opportunity to play with ingredients that none of us would really choose to do in, in a bigger batch. And then I, with a relatively practiced palate, can taste our end products and let y'all know what did or didn't come through. The hope is that if we make it to a season two, <laughs> season two, of Brews Lab, which I'm still trying to figure out what we can do to, to shake up the format as we go forward. Maybe we bring some of these interesting ingredients back and we try and really highlight how we can make them work, which I think could be fun. It's good science, good experimentation. And we all as a community learn from it collectively, uh, which I think is cool. All right, y'all. So today we mixed up a country fruit wine that's probably in the range of 1.083. We've got honeydew, a whole lemon, a whole banana, sugar, and coconut. I think that covers everything that's in there. We pitched EC1118 yeast, a very hearty wine yeast, and we added some yeast energizer to give it a nice 
oomph as it starts building up its colony. It smells good, so maybe it'll taste good. If you want to join us on Discord, it's discord.doingthemost.org. And we've got a really robust community of really excellent brewers over there with a lot of experience that are willing to help new brewers. And again, one last big shout out to the amazing patrons and YouTube members who support the channel on a regular, sustainable basis. These folks here, these 40-something folks here, basically power all of this. Big debt of gratitude to all of you for helping make this possible and offsetting the exorbitant costs of doing the most. Stay safe, stay healthy. Cheers.